Thank you very much for the invitation to uh, open uh, this year's spring conference. And uh, let me offer my warm congratulations uh, on CASE for uh, its first 25 years of existence. Um, my organization, the Kobe Lang Institute for Christian Ethics, is five uh, in a few months' time. And you're all invited to come over to the UK to <laughs> join in the celebration. So my topic then, um, what makes a nation Christian? <coughs> In 2004, April 2004, the pastor of a prominent evangelical church in St. Paul, Minnesota, preached a series of sermons called The Cross and the Sword. In it, he offered his perspective on Christian political involvement and tried to explain why his church would not be supporting any candidate in the run-up to the presidential election later that year. <coughs> the result was explosive. He reports that while many people expressed huge relief for being freed from a widespread expe expectation that Christians should tow a conservative line, 20% of his congregation, that's about 1,000 people, left the church. Some of you will know that this pastor is Gregory Boyd, and his series became the widely discussed and uh, controversial book, The Myth of a Christian Nation. I'm seeing a few heads nod here. Some people recognize that. Published in 2006 is the book, if you're curious, later on. The subtitle is How the Quest for Political Power is Destroying the Church. I'm tempted to read his uh, succinct statement of his central thesis, which comes on page three, but I think I might lose my entire audience if I did that straight away, so I'll, maybe you can ask me in Q&A later on. I'll, I'll quote it to you then. The proposal that a nation might be Christian or might not be Christian touches many people at a very deep level. In nations such as the USA and the UK, with a rich and powerful historical legacy of Christian influence, this is hardly surprising. Faith and nation have become so deeply intertwined for so long in our national histories and consciousness that it's often difficult to draw a bright line between what we have inherited uniquely from Christianity and what's been bequeathed to us from our own idiosyncratic and ambivalent national histories. Some people would even question whether we need to draw a line at all. For them, it's just obvious that the US or the UK is Christian, and even to raise the question may seem unpatriotic or unfaithful. But in fact, many Christians disagree deeply about what it means for a nation to be Christian and about what the public national requirements of their faith should be and how far the practices of their nation actually conform to those requirements. Debates easily get mired in recrimination and blown off course by strong emotions, even in England. Take it, <laughs> take it from me. Now, you'll be relieved to, relieved to hear that I'm not going to attempt a definitive assessment of whether or how far the US is a Christian nation even though I'm heading back to Canada early tomorrow morning. <laughs> Instead, I want to interrogate the very idea of a Christian nation and to do so in a way which I hope will help all of us to reflect on whether, and if so, in what senses, it's a valid idea at all. Now, in the bulk of the talk, it's the second part, I'm going to distinguish four different senses of the term Christian nation and assess how far each is useful. But before I do that, I want to spend a bit of time first asking a prior question, which is what a nation is. How we answer that question will make a significant difference to how we think about the idea of a Christian nation. So this is my first section then, what is a nation? And here I want to suggest two things. Firstly, that nations and states are different. And second, that nations are elusive and morally complex. It's very important to distinguish uh, the nation from the state, even though in ordinary language we often use the terms interchangeably. The term state refers to an apparatus of political institutions with constitutional authority to govern the public realm of a society. Uh, I often refer to uh, the state as the political community rather than the state, although I'll use both terms in this lecture. And I like the term political community because it reminds us that the state 
has members. The name we give to individual members of the political community is citizens. A political status bringing with it a package of rights, duties and expectations arising from membership in a specific political community. So different political communities have different packages of such rights. We often refer to the citizens collectively as the people, as in we the people, or should I say you the people. <laughs> we haven't forgiven that, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, all the talk about in the States about you guys taking America back, sometimes we have the same thought as well. You know, <laughs> but, uh, 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 right now we're in a budget deficit situation, so we just couldn't afford to buy you out. You know, it would just be too, uh, too expensive. So the political community then is a community of people insofar as they possess a specific status, that of citizen. But the political community is al also includes the apparatus of political institutions intended to serve citizens in a particular way, namely by securing, this is how I frame it, a public framework of justice. Federal and state governments and legislatures, courts, local government, and the vast array of public bodies that make up the uh, executive branch at many levels. We can sum all this up by saying that the state, here's my definition, is a political community of government and citizens existing to promote an order of public justice. Let's read that again. The state is a political community of government and citizens existing to promote an order of public justice. Well, the state is not the same thing as the nation. The state is a legal body that has clear boundaries of territory and membership. But the nation is a much more elusive, hard to define reality. It's a socio-cultural rather than a political phenomenon. You can try to grasp the nation precisely, but it quickly slips through your fingers. The nation is more than what I just called the people, namely the citizens. It's more an organism than an institution. It's a complex of practices, customs, mores, values, behavior patterns, arising from the public interaction of millions of individuals, associations, and networks of many kinds. The nation is a much looser and more sprawling reality than the state. You could put it this way, that it's not an entity, but it's an environment. Well, neither the station nor the state embrace everything about our lives. So when I have dinner at home with my family or worship with my fellow believers in church, I'm not functioning either as a member of the nation nor as a member of the state, but of my family or church. And this is an important limitation on the scope of both these terms. And in fact, this, incidentally, is one reason why many British Christians, not all, but many British Christians, don't like flags in their churches, whereas you guys seem to love them in your churches. It's also why Gregory Boyd says that the fourth, uh, July the 4th should not be considered a Christian holiday. And on that point, I think he's correct. Well, you might ask why I don't just use the term society to refer to this wider organic reality. The reason is that when we speak of a nation, we also have its distinctive history in view. And the term society just doesn't capture that so well. Nations are historical constructs. They generate narratives and are in turn sustained by them. Stories of origins, journeys, struggles, ambitions, conflicts, failures, achievements, renewals, and hoped for destinies. And in turn, these narratives tend to produce particular sets of characteristics or customs or values among those who are part of the nation, or at least, even if they don't feel part of the nation, are shaped by the nation's history. And in turn, these help shape what we call national identity. National identity, too, is a very real thing, but also hard to define. If you ask any group of citizens in pretty much any Western state, to list the five defining characteristics of their national identity and you'll get a very wide range of answers. Or what you'll get is a reference to 
the values like, for example, freedom, toleration, democracy, self-reliance, hospitality to foreigners. But these aren't specific to any one nation. These are pretty universal values, although they might be more pronounced in some nation than in others. So a proper answer to the question of national identity usually involves not the listing of characteristics, but the telling of a story. So, national narratives and national identities, unlike states, lack clear borders and membership. But moreover, they're also constantly in flux. Indeed, they're constantly in debate. The dominant narrative of most nations, that's if there is a dominant narrative, there usually is, is contested by at least some of its members, sometimes by substantial minorities. So ask an African-American to narrate the history of the American nation, and you'll get a different story to the one offered by a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant or a third-generation Italian. Ask a Native American or a newly arrived Mexican American what it means to possess an American identity, and the same contrast uh, will very likely emerge. Or back home, you ask a Scotsman or a Northern Irishman what it means to be British, and uh, you might get a number of expletives thrown at you, um, <laughs> but you'll certainly hear a different story to what most Englishmen like, like me would give. Actually, not like me, because I'm 50% ethnically Irish, and I'm also married to a Dutch woman and I've lived in Canada for eight years, so I'm a bit of a mess in that respect. <laughs> <coughs> so, when we get to the question, in what sense is my nation Christian, or in what sense can any nation be Christian, we first need to be clear about which version of the nation we have in mind. We can't just assume that everyone will know what we mean or agree with our account of what it means to be American or British or Irish or Canadian. I'll come back to that point later. So a national community, then, that's a group of people who find themselves bound up in some way in the same historical narrative or set of narratives, the national community is not the same thing as the political community, the state. And hopefully the payoff from that point will become clearer as I move to the next part of the talk, in which I now want to distinguish and assess four senses of the term Christian nation. So section two, what is a Christian nation? And the four senses of the term I want to consider, I've called the sociological, the constitutional, the historical, and the democratic. So let me start with the, what I'm calling the sociological sense, the most straightforward sense. Well, a nation could perhaps be termed Christian if a significant majority of its population adheres to Christianity. So, for example, in, in the last uh, British national census in 2001, I don't know if you, you must have censuses here, I guess uh, we have them every 10 years. Uh, last one was 2001. The next one is actually happening right now. In fact, just as I left, I had to ask my wife, can you fill the form in? I haven't had time to fill it in. The deadline is Friday or something. So, in the last British national census of 2001, quite surprisingly, over 70% of British people identified themselves as Christian. Do I detect sceptical looks around the room? <laughs> well, there were plenty back home as well. Uh, the significance of this figure is obviously limited once we note that, really, uh, the much better indicator of serious Christian commitment is church attendance. I mean, that's not infallible either, but it's a much more serious indicator of Christian commitment. And there the figures are not quite so optimistic. I can't remember exactly what, what they were, but the figures are something like in the region of 10% or less. And, and this is why um, an organisation called the British Humanist Association has in recent weeks been urging non-believers to state this clearly in the next census and not just tick Christian unthinkingly. And, you know, fair game to them. Um, don't we want censuses to reflect honestly what people really think? Well, I predict that the figure will be much less than 70% this time round, whatever the British Humanist Association said. Well, in his um, wide-ranging new book, um, Politics According to the, the Bible, American theologian Wayne Grudem, I'm sure his name will be known to some of you here, asked the question, 
are a majority of people in the, in the United States, Bible-believing, evangelical, born-again Christians? Not surprisingly, he says no. His estimate is actually about 20% of the population, though he's also prepared to add conservative Roman Catholics to the relevant calculation. But even that group doesn't, he thinks, bring the total up to anything like a majority of the population. Now, I'd be inclined to widen the relevant spectrum a little bit beyond those two groups myself, but probably not so far as to embrace the majority of Americans as serious, practicing Christians whose lives will make a difference to the character of the nation. So I agree with uh, Wayne Grudem that in the sociological sense, the US is not a Christian nation, and the UK is even less so. But suppose a majority were, what would follow from that fact? Even if the majority of Christians were truly Christian, that wouldn't in itself necessarily settle any disputes in the realm of law or public policy. Unless you favour a crudely majoritarian view of democracy, which is willing to override the rights of minorities in the interests or demands of a numerical majority of citizens. Well, I think I can confidently assert that to do that would be both unchristian and un American. Now, of course, Christians will want as many of their fellow citizens as possible to share their faith. That's an essential implication of the missionary task of the church. But force of numbers in itself is never sufficient to justify using state power either to advance the cause of the gospel or to give Christians any kind of advantage denied to other minorities. Okay, that's the first sense, what I'm calling the sociological sense, and just offered a few reflections on the significance of that sense. Let me turn now to the second sense, which I've called the constitutional sense. <coughs> And here's where my earlier distinction between nation and state begins to prove important. Because to speak of a constitutionally Christian nation is actually to talk about a Christian state. That's what's meant by the term. For a constitution, which is a legal and political document, cannot make a nation Christian merely by declaration. If we think outside Christian countries, current democratic protests against oppressive Islamic states like Saudi Arabia or Iran and others illustrate a wider point about the limits of law to bring about religious fidelity or belief. No legal document can reach into the complex activities and interactions that make up a nation and transform them in a Christian direction. Some of you may or may not know, some of you may know and others won't know that the Canadian Constitution mentions God in its preamble. Actually, how many, knew, how many of you knew that? Not a single person? Oh, that's shocking. <laughs> but it's interesting because, of course, it's a dead letter. It doesn't mean anything. It's had no impact whatsoever. By the way, this was only introduced about 30 years ago. And it was the result of a political compromise struck between the major political parties at the time uh, uh, when they were drawing up a new constitution for Canada. So God is in the Canadian constitution as a result of a backroom deal between Canadian political parties. I, I haven't asked him directly what he thinks about that. I think he regards the whole thing uh, as uh, with a matter of indifference, frankly. I think he probably, it's the last thing on his mind. But seriously, the fact that you can mention God in a constitutional document has no impact in itself on the rest of the state or indeed on the rest of, of the nation. And Christians, of all people, should understand the limits of law to change people's hearts. Okay, that's just by way of a, a cautionary note. But let's think a bit further about what this term could mean in practice. There are, in fact, two distinct ways in which any state could qualify as constitu uh, constitutionally Christian. 
One is if its constitution explicitly endorses the Christian religion. Well, I, I mentioned Canada. That just mentions God and not even Christianity. The better example would be the Irish constitution of 1937. And let me just read two sections of Article 44 of the 1937 Irish Constitution. <clears throat> Number one, the state acknowledges that homage of public worship is due to Almighty God. It shall hold his name in reverence and shall respect and honour religion. Two, the state recognises the special position of the Holy Catholic Apostolic and Roman Church as the guardian of the faith professed by the great majority of its citizens. So that's one way you can actually write Christianity into the Constitution itself. The other way that a state can be constitutionally Christian is if it has an established church, as in England, for example, since at least 1534, when Henry VIII nationalized the Roman Catholic Church, brought it under the control of the state, and made it the Church of England. As I was thinking about this, I thought how bizarre it would be if somebody presumed to set up a church called the Church of America. Uh, actually, probably somebody has somewhere <laughs> around. <laughs> but the very idea is bizarre as soon as you, you state it. In any case, uh, in any event, uh, England is certainly Christian in this specific sense. Uh, England, of course, isn't the same as Britain. Britain, or the United Kingdom, which includes Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, is a more complex matter. But let me just read you this uh, statement from a parliamentary committee. This was a House of Lords Select Committee on Religious Offences in England and Wales in, in 2003. It said this, The Constitution of the United Kingdom is rooted in faith, specifically the Christian faith exemplified by the established status of the Church of England. The United Kingdom is not a secular state. Last month, two High Court judges in Britain asserted during a controversial religious liberty judgment that, quote, the laws and usages of the realm do not include Christianity in whatever form. They were wrong. An elementary legal mistake made by two very senior uh, High Court judges. So that's the state of affairs in England, and similar comments would apply to other states which have established churches. But what do we make of this constitutional sense of a Christian nation in either of those two senses? Well, I don't think I need to spend very long before an American audience arguing that this sense of Christian nation is problematic. Both senses of a constitutional Christian state I just noted seemed ruled out clearly by the no establishment clause of the First Amendment of the US Constitution. And I'm going to assume that none of you here wants to delete that clause from the American Constitution. Although I think probably many of you would prefer it to be interpreted uh, rather more intelligently by some of your secular-minded uh, judges. Well, I'm a member of the Church of England, as it happens. Um, but I'm in a minority because I've long favored the progressive dismantling of the apparatus of establishment, and it remains frustrating and often mystifying to me how many of my fellow Anglicans don't get the point. They'd say back to me that I don't get the point, of course. That's the debate that we're having. But it seems to me there are two good theologically grounded reasons why a constitutionally Christian state in either form is a bad idea, and therefore why a state possessing something like a no establishment clause is arguably more Christian than one that lacks it. First, it would be bad for states. It bypasses the fact that states are not the sort of entity that are equipped to assess the truth of religious beliefs. And the resulting principle that states should therefore relate to different religious beliefs among their citizenry impartially. Second, a constitutional a constitutionally Christian state, would be bad for churches. It tempts them to lean on constitutional advantage rather than their own missionary energies. And it tempts them to keep sidling up to government at the risk of muting their prophetic voice. And finally, it leaves them vulnerable to theologically compromising political interventions in their internal affairs. <coughs> 
It's worth acknowledging briefly, nevertheless, that there are, there are some Americans who would like to see the US become an officially Christian state. Uh, maybe some of you would be in that company, in which case do raise questions later on. The most prominent are those associated with a school of thought variously known as theonomy, Christian reconstructionism, or dominion theology. Uh, but there's also a smaller school that sometimes is called national confessionalism. Now, while these different schools differ in many respects, they share the view that the American state ideally should be declared explicitly Christian. One writer sums this view up uh, as the call that, quote, all contemporary nations should officially declare allegiance to Jesus Christ in their public documents and devise political structures and policies that honour God and promote his justice. This is because God expects nations to adopt the same practice of covenanting as Old Testament Israel did. I'm quoting there Gary Scott Smith's book. And I'll come back to that notion of covenanting uh, later on. Well, I think there's a fundamental theolog theological objection to this entire line of argument. Now, as it happens, this objection also applies to the third sense of the Christian nation that I'm going to discuss. So let me first discuss that third sense, and then I'll come back to discuss the objection later, which applies to both. So, third sense of the term Christian nation uh, I want to discuss is historical, the historical sense. And uh, I'll spend a, a bit longer on this because it's more complex and also because I think there is actually some value in it. It's often asserted in the same breath as the second constitutional sense, but in fact it's useful to distinguish the two senses. And here I hope we'll see the relevance of my earlier remarks on what a nation is. We can, I think, quite properly speak of a nation being Christian if its history, and therefore its identity, have been deeply formed by the cumulative cultural impact of the Christian tradition, and if that influence remains visible today. Many Christians in the US, and indeed in the UK, are anxious at the steady advance of secularism in public life, as they should be and are increasingly arguing that many of our fundamental civil and political values, the rule of law, human rights, tolerance, democracy, and so on and so forth, were bequeathed by the unique historical legacy of Christianity, even if they were opposed by some Christians. They claim that these values, these so-called first things, as the religious journal of that name calls them, will become threadbare if that legacy is ignored or repudiated by public institutions, placing the nation's future in jeopardy. Uh, you'll be familiar with American voices making this case, I'm sure. Um, let me quote a prominent British voice, the former Anglican bishop uh, Michael Nazir Ali, who is from Pakistan, which, as you probably are aware, is an Islamic state. Nazir Ali is keen to remind British people that they need to defend their Christian historical legacy if they are to resist the assaults of both secularism, on the one hand, and Islamic fundamentalism, on the other. And I'm going to quote from him now, and I'm sure that many Americans will be able to affirm the relevance of his case for the US. He says this, Christian faith has been central to the emergence of our nation and its development. We cannot really understand the nature and achievements of British society without reference to it. In a plural, multi-faith and multicultural society, it can still provide the resources for both supporting and providing a critique of public life in this country. Christian faith is necessary to understand where we have come from, to guide us to where we are going, and to bring us back when we wander too far from the path of national destiny. Now, this sort of claim is often associated with conservative political stances, like those of the journal First Things. So, it's worth noting that uh, another version of it has actually been endorsed by a leading liberal secularist philosopher, namely the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas. Some of you may have heard his name. And I'd like to quote um, what is actually a rather dense passage 
from Habermas. Uh, I think once I've got through that dense passage by this German philosopher, we'll have reached the kind of the most demanding concentration point in the lecture, so hopefully it'll be sort of downhill after that. <laughs> okay, so just hang on for a couple of minutes till I get through that quote. Um, Habermas is speaking broadly of Western culture, but I think the point he makes applies to the individual nations of the West as well, like the US and the UK. He claims that the mutual influence of Christianity and Greek thought has decisively shaped key ideas in Western political philosophy. These influence, he says, hey, brace yourselves, promoted the assimilation by philosophy of genuinely Christian ideas. This has left its mark in normative conceptual clusters with a heavy weight of meaning, such as responsibility, autonomy and justification, or history and remembering, new beginning, innovation and return, or emancipation and fulfilment, or individuality and fellowship. Philosophy has indeed transformed the original religious meaning of these terms, but without emptying them. One such translation that salvages the substance of a term is the translation of the concept of man in the image of God into that of the identical dignity of all men that deserves unconditional respect. This goes beyond the borders of one religious fellowship and makes the substance of biblical concepts accessible to those who have other faiths and those who have none. Uh, in other words, Christianity has helped bequeath to Western nations some of their most basic and widely shared civil and political values. So it's not just Christians and it's not just conservative Christians that are prepared to acknowledge that very important historical point about the cumulative impact of Christianity on core Western values. Now, these claims by uh, Michael Nazir Ali and Jürgen Habermas are made, as you can see, at a very general level. I broadly agree with them. But things get more complicated when we try to specify more closely how Christian ideas have shaped our particular national traditions. For these traditions are, to put it mildly, a very mixed bag. And here let me pick up again my earlier discussion of national narratives. I noted earlier that such narratives are often complex and difficult to pin down. Now I want to emphasize the point that whatever degree of consensus there may be about the content of these narratives, any account of them is inevitably going to be disputed and it will be legitimately so. So just consider some examples. Wayne Grudem, in his book, asks, asks the question, uh, is the United States a Christian nation? By the way, his book is about 600 pages. Uh, it's a sort of doorstop rather than the book. Um, and it just covers everything. It you know, addresses every conceivable question you could, you could wish to. I haven't read it all. In fact, I've only read a few pages. So I just zeroed in on this particular section, is the United States a Christian nation, in which he comes up with nine senses of a Christian nation. I felt quite disheartened at that point. You know, I thought I'd struggle to get four, and in two pages he comes out with nine. <laughs> anyway, you can follow that up if you wish. It's a helpful discussion. One of them uh, concerns the question, is Christian teaching the primary religious system that influenced the founding of the United States? That's a key question for any American who wants to understand their own national narrative. Grudem answers unhesitatingly, Yes, it is. Now, I was intrigued uh, to discover an even more explicit affirmation of this view in a joint resolution of the Senate and House of Representatives in 1983, authorizing President Reagan to declare that year the year of the Bible. Um, there may be some people here who are old enough to remember that. I don't know. I'm not, I don't see any heads nodding. Oh, one here, correct. <laughs> You could have been director here for 25 years, couldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> the resolution asserted this. Let me quote it to you. It's less dense than Habermas. The Bible, the word of God, has made a unique contribution in shaping the United States as a distinctive and blessed nation. Biblical teaching inspired the concepts of civil government that are contained in our Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the U.S., the history of our nation clearly illustrates the value 
of voluntarily applying the teachings of the scriptures in the lives of individuals, families, and societies. Note that word voluntarily slipped in there. Everyone breathes a sigh of relief at that point. Or consider some British voices making a similar point. Uh, one Catholic theologian claims that the Judeo-Christian tradition is what is most fundamentally form-giving in English society and culture. Indeed, he claims it was the sanctifying impact of the gospel which actually created the English nation in the first place. He says, the emergence of England as a nation coincides with its conversion. Well, I think these statements certainly have some element of truth in them. How far and in what ways are questions for experts in American and British history and theology, and I'm not going to go further into that detailed territory. I mean, for example, you know, the long debate uh, in uh, his American historians, were the founders orthodox Christians or deists? That's a really important question to ask if you're asking whether Br America was founded as a Christian nation. Or was it founded as a deist nation? Well, many Americans, uh, indeed many American Christians, um, would hesitate to give the kind of unqualified endorsement of a version of the American national narrative expressed by Wayne Gruden or by that congressional resolution. Not least African Americans or Native Americans whose own history was forged in the darkest and most violent chapters of American nation building at a time when many of its national leaders thought they were doing God's will. So our national narratives are, as a matter of fact, widely contested. And in a society like ours, UK, that values free speech and pluralism, such disputes are inevitable and legitimate. That's not to say that all versions of a national narrative are equally valid. To say that would be to abandon entirely the task of social critique. And Christians can't do that for one simple reason, which is that they believe in the doctrine of sin. Scripture teaches, and so Christians must confess, that all nations, just like all individuals, are sinful and fall far short of the glory of God. All nations are badly messed up by selfishness, greed, moral laxity, corruption, exclusivity. And some fall victim at periods of their history to racism, imperialism, militarism, nationalism, and xenophobia. I regret to say that that statement is true of my own nation, which is why I recoiled when former Prime Minister Tony Blair declared in his resignation speech that this country is a blessed nation, the British are special, the world knows it. In our innermost thoughts, we know it. This is the greatest nation on earth. Now, you know that's wrong because you know that America is the greatest <laughs> nation on earth. Right? That was a lapse, to be fair, in Tony Blair's general public rhetoric, but it was a very revealing one. <coughs> the doctrine of sin must therefore compel Christians to ask whether their preferred version of their national narratives has been subjected to a deep enough self-critique. Whether we may be living in denial about the underside of our national histories and glossing over our collective sins. It's easy to spot the defects in our opponents' versions of the national narrative. Take, for example, the secular liberal, uh, the triumphant, sorry, the triumphalist secular liberal narrative of ever-expanding freedom, which, however, ignores the silent holocaust of millions of unborn Americans over the last half century. But our own Christian versions may also be skewed by self-congratulatory myths, such as the so-called white man's burden that was used to justify British imperialism in the 19th century, or by notions like manifest destiny in American history. Our national stories need to be sobered, chastened, by an honest reckoning with their victims. Now, we don't need to go as far as Gregory Boyd, who at one point in his book asserts that America is about as pagan as any country we could ever send missionaries to. We don't need to go that far. I certainly wouldn't go that far. I want to get out of here alive. 
But we do need to recognise that our histories are always a combination of praiseworthy achievements to be celebrated and defended and shameful failures and injustices to be repented of and avoided in the future. Uh, time's against me, so I'm just looking ahead to see if I can abbreviate some of this. I want to get to my fourth sense, certainly. In conclusion to this section, there is certainly, I think, a proper sense, albeit a limited sense, in which we can talk about nations as Christian in this historical sense. Namely, when some of their most important achievements and virtues are demonstrably dependent on the cumulative influence of Christian faith permeating through the complex fabric of national life over many centuries. But such appeals to Christian history must be made circumspectly, humbly, and with a frank willingness to admit profound failure in the past and in the present. But there's another more specifically theological problem linked to the claim that particular states or nations are or have been historically Christian. And I'm just going to try and ad-lib this part so that I can finish within the 45 minutes that Vince very kindly uh, allotted me. Briefly, some advocates of both the constitutional and the historical sense of the idea of a Christian nation operate on the assumption that states and nations today can have covenanted relationships to God akin to those of biblical Israel. I quoted a sent sentiment to that effect just earlier in the lecture. They think that uh, states and nations even in the New Testament era, namely ours, can and should display the unified religious character of the Old Testament polity. But this overlooks the radical dispensational discontinuity between the Old and the New Covenant. <coughs> there, was ever, there was only ever one covenanted nation in God's economy of salvation and that was biblical Israel. Nowhere has God ever revealed that he has a covenanted relationship with any other nation in history. There's simply no evidence. There's nothing in scripture, uh, and where else could we turn to hear God's view on the matter, frankly? Upon the inauguration of the new covenant, God no longer mediates his redemptive activity in the world by any special relationship with a particular nation or political order. God doesn't offer most favoured nation status to anyone. But further, the New Testament people of God are clearly constituted from its very beginning as a transnational community. In Jesus Christ, the Gentiles are brought fully into a covenant relationship with God, and we see this enacted visibly in the trans-ethnic, transnational character of the early church in Acts, which confessed that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. So, advocates of the historical sense of Christian nation are right to remind our nations of what they risk losing if they publicly repudiate their Christian legacies. But we must avoid speaking as if our nations enjoyed any special covenantal relationship to God or any special place in his providential purposes. Well, if those kinds of appeals are invalid, we're still left with the question of how Christians today in the New Testament era should exercise legitimate political influence in the post-covenantal nations that we inhabit today. And that leads me to my fourth sense of a Christian nation which I'm simply calling the democratic sense. Well, a democratic political system is one in which there are significant openings for effective popular representation, in which the people can exercise wide and sometimes decisive influence over who governs them, over how they govern, and over what goals government should pursue. Well, of course, there are many things wrong with the way that our existing democracies actually function, and I won't rehearse those to you tonight, but in the better functioning democracies, 
It is the case that the people do exercise significant influence over governments. Democracy gives to all citizens formally equal political status, which means that all can exercise political rights and hold political office. So Christian citizens in nations like the US and the UK have considerable opportunities to influence government according to their distinctive vision of the public good. Well, as you know, Christians are taking those opportunities. And the results are, not surprisingly, mixed. Some have lapsed into shrill or polarizing rhetoric. Some have launched ill-considered, ill-timed, or narrowly self-interested campaigns. I could give you British examples if you're bored with American ones. <laughs> Yet over the last generation, many Christians have engaged in democratic activity responsibly with a proper respect for the religious liberties of their fellow citizens and with a commitment to persuading their fellow citizens uh, with credible public policy arguments rather than simply citing biblical texts as if the US were, in fact, a constitutionally Christian state. So there are beginnings of reasons to hope that Christians are taking up their distinctive democratic responsibilities. And let me say this, that many more Christians could be brought to act in that way if they were properly equipped with sufficient Christian political wisdom and sufficiently formed in the practices of democratic citizenship. Suppose, for example, that as many as 10% of American citizens, let's not even be as optimistic as Wayne Grudem, as many as 10% were seriously seeking to live a Christian life and put it into practice politically in informed ways. Suppose, too, that those Christians could even begin to find some measure of agreement on the core principles of Christian politics. They're not going to agree on their policy implications, but at least the core principles. Principles of justice in areas like family policy, environmental policy, economic policy, foreign policy, and so on. The result would not be anything like a fully or even predominantly Christian nation, but it would be a nation in which the cumulative impact of a Christian political vision held by at least an active minority of democratically engaged citizens, often in alliance with other minorities, could shape public debate and government policy in identifiable and constructive ways. And so, hopefully, make a notable contribution to the healing of some of the nation's scars. Well, Maybe we shouldn't call the result of that a Christian nation, but it would be a nation with a dynamic and restorative Christian presence. And that, I think, is a goal that is worth our very best efforts. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's take some questions. Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay, um, so the question was, uh, I'm repeating the question back because it's being recorded for other people. Uh, the question was, um, in reference to how was his view that um, Christian engagement and democracy um, would um, appeal to, is that what you're saying, appeal to liberal, the liberal idea uh, that um, liberalism converges in some respects with Christianity? Mm -hmm. Is that the point that you were making? The narrative of liberalism yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, that, that, so that liberalism can cooperate with Christianity. Uh, it's funny, because I thought you were actually going to say the opposite at that point. 
Uh, I thought you were going to say that Hawass, Hawass's view was that Christians shouldn't cooperate well, well, that with liberalism. Right, no, that, that is what I was saying. Yeah, okay, right, yeah, fine. Got, got to clarify that. Um, well, as so often with Stanley Hawass and his school, uh, you know, we need to respond to him with a resounding Bartian yes and no. <laughs> um, that is to say, yes. Hawass is absolutely right, and by the way, um, Gregory Boyd is coming out of the same stable, uh, in case you hadn't sp spotted that already. Um, absolutely right to draw our attention to, and as I try to do here, the, the, the danger of blurring the boundaries between the, na the nation and, and the church, between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world, and the constant temptation that all of us have, whatever nation we belong to, to mute the critique that the gospel presents to any nation, whatever it may be. So Hawass is absolutely worth reading to um, you know, put some backbone in us when, we te when we're tempted to sort of play down the prophetic critique that the church should constantly be presenting to, to the outside world. Uh, but I happen to think his, his analysis of liberalism is wrong. That is, it's, it's one-sided. It's seriously one-sided. Liberalism is not as comprehensively opposed to the gospel as he seems to present. Um, and therefore, nations which have been shaped by liberalism are not absolutely antithetical to Christianity. On the contrary, they have historically been quite hospitable to Christians. Uh, you know, if, if, if you're uh, coming from a, a different planet and you ad adhere to some strange religion and you want to find the place in the world where you'll be left alone, most likely, you probably couldn't do much better than the USA um, or the Northern Canada. Not Toronto so much, but Northern Canada. <laughs> um, so I, th I think he's often wrong about that. And I think this is because he, well, it's various reasons I think are, are motivating his analysis of liberalism there. Um, partly it's historical that I think he, he doesn't recognize the fact that fundamental constitutional principles like government accountability, the rule of law, the principle of popular representation, the, uh, the uh, norm of impartial judiciary, independent judiciary. These, these norms are not accidental products of the West. They are, I think, significantly the result of Christian influence, not exclusively, but significantly. And I don't think he honors that legacy sufficiently. But absolutely, we need to hear him yapping away, you know, over our shoulders all the time to warn us. Uh, that's how he talks about other people, you know. He, I mean, let's, let's be give him back what he, what he delivers. Um, uh, you know, the constant reminder to retain prophetic critical edge. That's critical. Yeah. Sir, uh, my name is Judith, and I'm a Peter Pilgrim Science student here. Okay. Thank, thank you so much for coming to speak to us. In light of your treatment of the second essential of the Christian nation, the constitutional sense in which you acknowledge that states are um, essentially in their Okay, that's a, that's a good question. The question was, uh, given the fact that states, um, we agree that states aren't equipped to assess the truth of religious belief, um, are they equipped in any sense to assess um, appropriate virtues that might be the basis of society? Is that the gist of your question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, let me make another distinction here. Uh, virtue is a large family, you know, with many members. And uh, one of those members, uh, we would call political virtues. Then there are all kinds of other virtues as well, virtues that are more central to um, neighborhood or family life or education, diff different sectors of society. Uh, but there are some which are specifically political. That is, they are virtues which make for the excellence of a political community. Let's say, use that Aristotelian, Macintyrean language. Um, they are not the totality of virtues. They would include things like uh, a commitment to deliberation and persuasion, uh, to tolerance of different viewpoints, um, to uh, procedural decision making, um, uh, to searching out norms of justice. Those are, I would say, 
characteristically political virtues. And, you know, they're in short supply everywhere, aren't they? You know, we all need more of them in every, in every state. They are necessary for states to not just exist, but to flourish and to function. So if you want a just state, you're going to have to have a certain residue of political virtues to make that happen. And where those virtues are absent, you see the results. You have unjust states, you have authoritarian states, you have corrupt states, you have nepotistic states, you have tribalistic states, you have clientelist states. You know, you, 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 as a political scientist, you'll be able to complete the list. Um, so those are essential, and it seems to me that it's quite proper, indeed it's necessary, for states to act to inculcate those virtues which are essential for its own proper functioning. That would be the distinction I make. So it's not the task of the state to inculcate good parenting virtues in my family. That's outside its brief. It can certainly put certain limits around kind of certain kinds of damage I might do to my kids. Uh, but it, but it, can't, it can't create parental virtue. It can't create, certainly can't create a sort of virtue, the gospel virtues that only the church can produce. So that's the distinction I make. It can act to promote those kinds of political virtues but it should draw the line um, at, at trying to create virtue outside the sphere of the political community. Now, we can have a debate about precisely what fits into each category, but that's the general suggestion I'd make. Yeah? Okay, the question was, um, <coughs> what do we make of or how do we respond to situations where Christians in government, in politics, uh, face what seems like a straight conflict between the obligations that they have as politicians and the obligations they have as Christians? Would that be about that? Yeah. Um, well, set back first and answer that in a more generic sense. Uh, this kind of situation is simply constitutive of life in general. That is, wherever you are, whatever function you're fulfilling, whatever area of life you're in, you are going to find those kinds of uh, moral conflicts. Certainly in a fallen world, you're going to find those conflicts. Um, and so in a sense, uh, one could just give the same answer uh, in politics as in any other. So take business. Uh, you're almost certainly, if you're going to be uh, working your way up the management structure of a business, you're going to find those kinds of conflicts. Same in trade unions, same in the media, wherever, same in education. You know, there, there, are, there is even political conflict in university departments. <laughs> okay. So, um, and I, I don't have any kind of special wisdom on how to deal with those conflicts. But in politics, uh, I think I'd say this. We often tend to think that the intensity of those conflicts is somehow morally more compromising in politics than it is in those other spheres of life. But I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, in that respect, I don't think that politics is, is morally inferior or muckier uh, than, it, than any other sphere of life. Um, so just as, I mean, in, in one's own family, you're dealing with those kinds of tensions all the time. So your kids growing up and they're taking their own direction, they're heading in unhealthy ways, which you think are very bad for them, for their spiritual life. You want to steer them back to the right path, but at the same time, you also want to honor their proper independence. And, you know, you want your interventions to be such that they will nurture responsible independence rather than conformity. So it's everywhere. Um, so I think we have to get away from the idea that politics is somehow dirtier than any, any other area of life. You didn't say that, but I'm, I'm kind of glossing that point. Um, but there are pl times when you simply have to confront the challenge and make a choice, and that might involve resigning. Or it might involve simply not pursuing a position if you can foresee 
that the conflict is going to be unacceptable or insurmountable for you at that particular time. These are often very individual decisions that you can't always generalize for, for other people in different situations. So faithfulness in any sphere of life um, today in our secular uh, society is going to involve those kinds of moral conflicts. It, we need to be prepared to say no to certain courses of uh, career development. We need to be able to say no to certain job offers. We need to be able to resign if, if there's a matter of conscience which, where we think the price is just too high. And so I'd say for anybody who's setting out on a career, you know, here's my career advice to Wheaton College. Be prepared to resign. Um, I mean, be ready in your, in your heart of hearts to, 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 to get to the point where you'll say, thus far and no further, on grounds of conscience, on grounds of fidelity to Christ, I will say no at that point, and I will you know, take the consequences of it. And I think we need all of us um, now and in future professional spheres to be working together as Christians in community to help each other work through these kinds of decisions. Very often we do this in a very individualistic way. You know, we sit at home on our own wrestling, you know, shall I resign, shall I not resign? We need to have some kind of reference group, um, um, a peer group of people who will advise us um, with, with senior, well, seasoned people advising on when would be the right time to resign or not. Um, anyway, I'm beginning to ramble, so it's time to stop. But thank you for the question. Um, oh, we've got loads of questions. I don't know who was first, but yeah, you go next. Um, I guess I would like to respond to something that you said. Yeah. Um, is not all, perhaps maybe politics is a little bit more complex, and here's why: is because it is <coughs> it deals with life and death decision making on a more profound and immediate level. Maybe because politics, in, in many cases, we're talking about the state, and the states are in, in many cases upheld by the legitimate. Um, use of force by one group right. or another. So how, how does a Christian engage in that complexity um, when it does seem, I would say, maybe a little bit murkier because it, it's life mm. and death? More. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so the, the question was, um, isn't politics, after all, more complex, perhaps the conflict's more intense because the state's coercive and its decisions involve or can involve the use of force? Um, actually, all state decisions rest upon the capacity to coerce, even if they're not actually overtly coercive. Um, that does obviously change the situation, no question about that. It certainly makes the decision more momentous. So, you know, the last few days and weeks, President Obama, Prime Minister Cameron and others have been deciding whether to bomb Libya. That's a hugely momentous decision for not just strategic and geopolitical um, considerations, but because of lives that will be lost. Um, so you're right that the, the scale and the, the, the consequences of state actions can be far more damaging than those of some other spheres. Although, you know, you could, y some decisions by large multinational corporations can actually be as killing, as, as, as potentially damaging to human life as, as those done by states. Um, yeah. Well, you know, in a fallen world, political authorities simply have to have coercion as the foundation necessary to, to compel their, their decisions. There's, there's no alternative to that. Now, Christians, um, you know, egged on by pacifists like Hawass and others, and joining forces with those sorts of people, will want to be trying to mitigate that force wherever possible and to humanize it wherever it's used. And in many cases, that kind of force is used recklessly, dangerously, oppressively. I mean, there's a whole story to be told there. So, so the overt use of force is always a very extreme and um, momentous decision. Um, so it, that does condition the, certainly it, it adds to the intensity and the moral seriousness of, of those um, sorts of political questions. Although I think I'd still want to say that at the end of the day, it, it doesn't create, let's say, a completely new moral situation, which has no precedence in any other sphere of life. That's a short answer to a, a, a good question. Um, let's find an order here. There's one question there, two, three, four. Let's see how that goes. Go ahead. 
Okay, the question was, uh, how would I respond to um, Rawls's proposal as to how states, societies should overcome uh, deep differences of comprehensive doctrine? Um, uh, well, the, the, the short and cowardly answer that I would like to give to that is to, is to say, ask, ask Brian McGraw, because he's just written a book on that, uh, which I have here. I was going to wave it in front of you, so here's my chance. Um, faith in politics, religion, and li liberal democracy has an excellent discussion of that very question, among many others there. Um, and I agree with, this, with the analysis that, uh, that, that Brian makes there, which is to say, basically, actually, I haven't read that chapter yet, so I can't say that I agree with it. Um, <laughs> but I... I pro I probably will. I probably will, yeah. I probably will. Um, in short, I think Rawls is, is, is partially right in his diagnosis of the problem. That is, we do live in a new era in the late 20th century, which didn't exist before. That is, we have uh, a situation of radical plurality. Uh, of fundamental convictions, what Charles Taylor calls deep diversity. That is our predicament, and it creates um, dilemmas that are wholly new, I think, both in degree and in, and in kind. Um, they're not entirely unprecedented in history. I mean, all history, all societies have had some degree of plurality and have had to cope with it in, in one way or the other. But what's distinctive about our society, and again, Rawls is right about this, is that our societies, at least in the West, are based on the principle of consent, which means that everybody has a stake in and a say in and is expected to be able to contribute to and be able to justify the fundamental principles on which the polity is based. So that does pre present a really difficult question. And, I mean, r roughly, there are, there are sort of two principal schools that respond to that situation, at least two. One is the deliberative school, of which Rawls is one version, Habermas is another, which is to say that we can't agree on the substance of our moral views, so what we have to do is to define a common language or a common set of communicative procedures, communi criteria of communicative validity, and if we all conform to those, then the end result we may not like it, but at least it will be legitimate. So that's the deliberative view. Then there's the agonistic view on the other side. That's a particular school of thought in contemporary political theory, which says, which is radically pluralistic, and says we simply have to concede that democracies will be arenas of insoluble contestation. Uh, there's no way of overcoming that. So let's not try to, as it were, level that conflict by establishing some sort of common language. Let's, if not celebrate it, at least redesign our democratic institutions in such a way that all of those different voices have maximum play in the public realm. So that's a much more boisterous, noisy you know, uh, area of contest, a model of, a model of democratic contestation. And, uh, well, I mean, briefly, I think it's you could probably say that a Christian political perspective has something distinctive to say somewhere in the middle of that debate. That is, unlike deliberativist liberals, because we believe in um, the epistemological fallenness of human beings, we do accept the agonistic analysis that there is going to be ineliminable, uh, unresolvable, persistent, deep disagreement. And I think there are good theological reasons, Augustinian reasons, for example, why we would accept that and not pretend that societies can reach some thick, pervasive moral consensus. Um, but at the same time, we, we also hold to another doctrine, not just the doctrine of the fall and the sin, but also the doctrine of creation, which, is, which, which leads us to say that we, are, we share a common human nature, we share a common created experience of being human such that the differences caused by moral pluralism are never going to be complete. They're never going to be absolute. There's never going to be a situation of total incommensurability. There will always be avenues of, of uh, communication, possibilities for reaching across that divide, because we are held together, so to speak, um, uh, by a common human nature, which is sustained by God. That's a sort of short kind of pointing in the direction of the kind of answer that 
you know, I would give. But yeah, Brian's book, I think, uh, gives you the, the complete account of that, I, I predict. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Um, are you next? Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, just let me try and get your question a bit more precise in my mind. So, um, so the question is, can, can the state... So I, I suggested earlier there's a boundary between virtues the state should promote, which are necessary to its own, its own fulfilment of its own functions, and those that do not fit in that category. And you're questioning whether the state knows how to make that distinction? Is that what you're uh, suggesting? Whether that distinction is possible. Okay, in terms right. Of whatever virtue it does set for itself, yeah. Okay, right, yeah. So, so if the state does draw some distinction between those kinds of virtues, then it, it identifies, let's say, an officially set of preferred public virtues, and they are, your, your point is, that they are going to have a spillover effect, and they'll start reshaping communities outside of the state. Right, yes. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a great observation. The answer to that is, uh, to your, your sort of second part of the question, is, is yes, states do that, that is the impact that public virtues will have. And that's, that's intentional, and that's not inherently a bad thing. So, for example, most Western societies after 1950, maybe before, came to the settled view that um, the vice of racial discrimination was simply unacceptable and could not be indulged as a private uh, a private indulgence, a private eccentricity, because it was inherently damaging to the public standing of, of racial minorities. So the state took a view and said, the, the virtue of, of racial equality, its respect for racial equality, is now going to have behind it a coercive authority of the state. Did that start to shape communities outside the state? Yes, it did. And aren't we grateful that it did do that? Certainly. And it still does that. And a number of things like that, the state, the state has reached the point where it says this virtue is a non-negotiable, and therefore it's public. Or rather, it's public, and therefore it's non-negotiable. Um, we're going to lay down the line, and we're going to enforce it. And that will have a knock-on effect on, on private behavior. Um, that's an inevitable state of affairs. So everything depends on what those virtues are. So I'm not trying to suggest that it's inherently wrong for the state to co inculcate a set of virtues. The key battleground is what they are, what is the content of those minimal virtues. And that's constantly up for grabs. That's constantly under negotiation, under contestation. And, you know, there's no sort of simple set of propositions that I, as a Christian, can simply roll out to resolve that question. We, we have to take with us are considered convictions on what are those essential public virtues and work for them, campaign for them, educate for them, persuade people behind them, seek to get them respected by the state where necessary. Um, uh, and it's a long haul. Um, and in some cases we'll win the battle and in some cases we'll lose it. In fact, we'll, it'll never be quite that simple. It will always be more or less. Um, but so on the question of Racial non-discrimination, no Christian, I think, hardly any Christians would dispute that. But now, and this may be in your mind, the latest area of contestation is particularly in the area of uh, family and sexual ethics. 
So there's a growing trend for jurisdictions here and in Europe, the UK as well, to, to, to place uh, sexual orientation in the same category as racial identity. And therefore to say that publicly disapproving of certain kinds of sexual practice, let's say, is akin to, is as publicly offensive as racial discrimination. That is now the, the rhetoric that is, is appearing from many, many public bodies. And I just think we have to contest that where we can. Um, because the two, the two, I think, are quite dissimilar. The two are not in the same category at all. And we, we simply have to work harder at trying to make a case um, why that's the case. So that's just one example of, of where, on the one hand, we want to definitely affirm the state's right to protect clear public virtues. On the other hand, we want to say, well, on this one, it's getting it badly wrong. And we've got to start you know, working to change that wherever we can. That's the beginnings of an answer anyway. Um, who was next? I think over there, yeah. Um, do you think that there are issues that Christians in the United States ought not to profess? That we currently are? Uh, the question was, uh, are there any issues on which Christians in the US should not be protesting, um, but, the, but on which they currently are protesting? That's a tough question. Um, you know, I don't have a complete list of what you guys have been up to <laughs> behind my back. Um, so I, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I, I think I have a general idea of what you mean here, that there are... I mean, that there isn't a single controlling mind here, is there? Uh, it's not as if the American church gets together, you know, the Church of America, that one that doesn't exist, <laughs> gets, to gets to America, gets, gets together and to say, OK, let's, let's deliberate about our top 20 priorities and uh, we'll divvy up the tasks and we'll, desi you know, we'll design a 20-year strategy. What you get is ad hoc, occasional, um, piecemeal, erratic, episodic interventions because that's the nature of American Christianity. And it's not that different in the, in the UK. Even, you know, we're, we have fewer denominations and we're a bit more uh, supine than you guys over, over there, but you know, we're a bit more conformist. But it's essentially the same situation. There's no single controlling mind um, so I, you know, I, I don't think I would want to say to, I, to identify any one issue that people are busy with and say stop. Um, probably I, I might have something to say about the way in which a campaign is being conducted. So for example, back in the UK, um, there's a lot of campaigning going on on religious liberty questions as there is here where there's a, a strong feeling that uh, the right of religious conscience in public employment, in private employment, in education and so on, is being squeezed unacceptably. And uh, I think that's correct. I think that is happening. I think it's very worrying. Um, and I think we ought to be responding to it. But that doesn't mean we have to fight every case. Uh, in fact, there was a case just a uh, few weeks ago um, involving a traditional Christian couple, Pentecostal couple, who wanted to be uh, registered for fostering children. You may have heard this case got over here. Uh, and they're traditional Christians. They hold traditional views of sexual ethics. And because they were not able to say to the professional people, um, we will give equal respect to homosexual practice as heterosexual practice, because they weren't able to say that, they were not deemed to be eligible to foster children. Well, I think that's a very bad decision. I mean, I, I think that's a crazy and an illiberal decision. Um, but there were particular circumstances in that case, and th there were worrying others as well, that made it not the best case to fight at that time. So there's a question of timing and tactics on all these campaigns. You know, is this the right time to launch a legal challenge? Is this the right time to launch a campaign for legislative change? Those are all circumstantial questions. Um, and you know, no one person can answer all of those questions in, 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 for, for other people. So I, d I wouldn't want to say that there's any issue where Christians should stop doing something, but they probably, in many cases, should think twice or three times or more carefully before they launch some kind of campaign. I, I do think there are some questions on which Christians are currently 
way too inactive. Um, and I'm probably going to offend some of you here by stating one of them, maybe two of them. Uh, you know, I, I happen to be persuaded of the scientific case about climate change and of the urgency of pretty far-reaching changes to our lifestyle, to our economic system, to our consumer practices, um, urgent changes to that in order to prevent really irreversible and deadly serious climate change uh, impacts to take place in the next 20 years. So I mean, I, th I'm on that side of that question. Um, Wayne Grudem, I haven't read this chapter, but I've skimmed that chapter on environmental policy. He's on the other side of the question. So you know, you have to read, t t read both and see, see which you agree with. Um, so I would say, I would want to say American Christians should be far more active on that question than they are. And, you know, I'm, I regret that Wayne Grudem is on the wrong side of the issue. So that, that would be my view. He'd disagree with me, I'm sure. Um, on the arms trade, um, there's a lot of work being done on international disarmament at the top diplomatic level. That's all great. But the arms trade is a massive contributor, in my view, to fueling military conflicts around the world. You know, people can only fight fight battles if they've got weapons. And most of the major Western nations who produce these weapons, including Britain, we're one of the leaders in the field, uh, are inadvertently sowing the seeds of civil conflicts by pumping large amounts of armaments into very unstable situations. I mean, British um, weapons or military vehicles were used recently in, I'm trying to remember which, Arab country that's just undergone a revolution. It's hard to keep up. Was it Tunisia? I think it might have been Tunisia. That's just one small example. So, you know, the arms trade, we're all quiet about it. We're not doing anything about it. In Britain as well. It's a major distortion of world politics and world economics. And we're not, we're just not attentive enough to it. So, that's, that's the, a medium, medium length answer to the question. Not, not a short enough one, but a medium length answer which says, no, I don't want to close anything down but there are certain things that we ought to do more of, and whatever we do, let's think twice, three times, four times, so that we get it right. Yeah. Okay, the question was um, uh, in reference to Habermas's analysis that uh, Christianity has contributed to core Western values. Uh, but the question was, um, can we really accept that analysis as valid? And is there any Christian content left? Would that be the way of putting your question? Yeah. Well, he obviously thinks there is. I mean, he, he actually specifically says that, that although the language has changed, the, the sort of the normative content is still alive. And I think he's right on that, actually. Uh, I think I would defend Habermas up to a point on that. So, the, you know, the, the notion of human dignity, let's say, which is a pervasive and universally endorsed value, at least in Western countries, actually in all countries, but certainly in Western countries, underpins a lot of our thinking and practice on human rights, on uh, equality before the law, and on other major areas of public policy and law. And uh, it's, um, it's of huge importance, it's of, it's of massive importance, and we, we should hold on to that. And the fact that a majority of the population don't share the Christian support for that particular viewpoint is regrettable, sure. Um, but we shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth. Uh, in other words, if, if a value is still alive and functioning in a society, then so long as on balance it's producing good fruits, well, let's shore it up, let's defend it, let's, uh, let's defend it in public, um, in our own rhetoric as well. And so it's perfectly right and often necessary for Christians to invoke the language of human dignity in public debates. Now, 
If somebody then says, well, what actually is human dignity? Then you're being asked to address a more foundational question. That is, what, what, is, the, what is the essence of human dignity? What is its source? What, what are its moral and spiritual foundations? And at that point, there are going to be divergences appearing. So in, in the West, I'd say there's basically two fundamental options here. One is essentially a Kantian view, which is that human dignity resides in the human capacity for rational autonomy or rational agency, so something like that. That's why it's important. A great deal of human rights thinking is founded philosophically on that idea. Well, I don't think that's a very good idea. Probably, probably don't, you don't either. It's not adequate in itself. Um, and in fact, uh, a book by the leading Christian philosopher Nicholas Walterstorff has recently delivered a trenchant critique of that very idea. Uh, it's called Justice, Rights and Wrongs. Any of you are interested in philosophy, political philosophy? So it's, a, it's, a, it's a hugely important book. Um, he argues that human rights can only be properly founded on really the love of God, on a notion of human worth d bestowed by the love of God. Um, well, I broadly agree with, with his analysis, but most of political debate, most of political lobbying, most of political communication does not take place at that foundational level. It takes place at that intermediate level where there is still some serious consensus and where that consensus can be mobilised to achieve good results. Now, how Asians might say, that's all too pragmatic. That's making too many concessions to liberalism. To which I respond, well, you know, politics is about accommodation. It's about making concessions. They're making concessions to us as well. Um, this is simply what democratic deliberation, deliberation and decision-making consists in. And, um, you know, if, if, that's, if that's the game you want to enter, those are the rules of the game, so to speak. That's not selling out. On the contrary, it's, it's seizing opportunities that otherwise uh, might not exist. So let's maintain our support of notions like human dignity and human equality, but let's also take whatever opportunities we can to encourage debate to take place at that more foundational level, where we then enter the realm not of political campaigning, but of uh, apologetics and ultimately of um, proclamation. And when we do that, how us can be a very important ally as we do that. I think there was, oh, was that the last question? Yeah, it's... Mm -hmm. it's Beyond 8.30? Yeah, yeah. Stop. Did it stop? Okay. Uh, I've been told that the, that the show's over by, by, the, by Vince here, so sorry about that.